morning. Hope you'll be able to tune in and join us. Hope you're doing well. Glad you found us. Whether you're watching live, whether you're watching later, we hope you're doing, a, doing great and having a good week so far. We're going to sing some songs, and we're going to look at God's Word, and we're going to celebrate how good He is. So our opening song is What a Friend, and we'd love for you to jump in and sing along with us. turn the speakers up on that one and sing along maybe even got the neighbors wondering about what you're doing there we do hope you're doing well hope you've had a good week if you've not had a good week i hope this will be an encouragement to you i know a lot of us uh, are in different places as we navigate whatever week this is of this uh, quarantine and pandemic and all of that uh, i just want to give you just a kind of an encouraging word and a kind of a thought here from Isaiah 43, verses 1 through 3, just to kind of center our time of worship and maybe give you a little bit of comfort to your heart and kind of center your thoughts this morning. This is what Isaiah writes long, long ago. He says, But now, O Jacob, listen to the Lord who created you. O Israel, the one who formed you, says, and this is what you need to hear, Do not be afraid, for I have redeemed you, I have called you by name. You are mine. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. What a Savior we have this morning a living, resurrected Savior who rolled the stone away at Easter and stands victorious over all of this darkness, sin, and death that plagues us. And what hope we have 
Because He Lives. Let's sing that next song together, Because He Lives. God sent His Son. keep that song here and uh, we're going to stop moment and, uh, and spend a time in prayer. You can kind of bump the next slide there, Brian. A number of things to pray about. There's some joys and concerns. Some joys, if I understand it right, Bonnie Clapp has a birthday today. So Bonnie, if you're watching, happy birthday. Matt Rentschler, uh, Jeff Rentschler's son, also has a birthday. So happy birthday to all of you. What a blessing you all are. Uh, there's a number of concerns right now to lift up, though. Uh, a number of folks uh, with some issues with this COVID-19. I sent a message out to many of you yesterday to pray for Annetta Robinson's daughter, Alicia. Alicia Bailey, she's tested positive for COVID-19. She works at that Providence Nursing Home, and if you've seen on the news, they've had a lot of cases there. So prayers for her, uh, prayers for Jeff and Lisa Condor's niece, Caitlin, and uh, for a friend of Corey's, Eric, that also uh, battling that. And for any others that might have some concerns or things, we want to lift up all of those in our church family and in your families and pray against that awful, awful thing. Uh, a number of other issues. Uh, Corey Walker wanted prayer for uh, Dolores Hall, who's been sick and in the hospital. And so prayers for her. Continue prayers for Jim Hunger and the knee. Pray that he gets some more mobility. Jim, if you're watching, we're praying for you and thinking of you. And then um, some of you may know uh, a longtime resident of Lexington uh, passed away. And so prayers for uh, Ed Heath and the family there. And uh, just thoughts and prayers for them. And then we want to spend a moment praying for all those that are still working during this, during this pandemic. Prayer for safety for them. I want to pray for all those right now who are not working. So uh, if you can promise not to fall asleep. You know, if you're in your PJs or on your couch or somewhere comfy right now, uh, if you can safely bow your head, would you do that and pray with me as we lift all these up? Let's pray. Well, gracious God, we're so grateful that we have hope. Because you live, we have hope and strength and help and peace. And Father, I pray that you would just flood our hearts in this season of uncertainty with peace and your grace. God, we're grateful that even in a, a season like this, there are joys. We're so grateful for Bonnie and all the ways that she served this church and been a blessing to this place. And pray there'll be a wonderful birthday for her. Even though I'm sure it'll be a different kind of birthday, let it be a special one. So prayers for Bonnie and Buddy and Paula and, and all of them on this special day. And God, there's a lot of concerns right now. Um, as this pandemic continues on and continues to hit us close to home. So we just lift up Annetta's daughter, uh, Alicia, 
We pray for Caitlin, and we pray for Eric, and for any others that we may know, or any others that may be close to us that are, uh, have tested positive or are waiting to hear some results back. We pray for healing graces in Jesus' name. We pray that there be no trace of this virus, that the virus would leave their bodies, not affect them in any kind of way. We just pray for grace and for healing in Jesus' mighty name. God, we lift up Dolores Hall, who's sick. Lord, we pray you just give her healing in all the way that she needs it throughout her body and uh, let her just get feeling stronger and better. And we pray for uh, continued improvement for Jim Hunger's knee. Let the mobility there just to get better and better so he can get back to work soon. And God, we're so grateful for work. Sometimes work can be a stress to us, sometimes even a headache. But Lord, what a blessing it is. We just pray right now for those that are in our church family and those that are watching that are still working. We pray for safety for them as they engage in, in their jobs and with the public. We pray for peace for them. For those that are working from home and dealing with challenges there, give them grace and the ability to focus and to be productive and also to enjoy the time at home. And for those, Jesus, who are not working, we pray for provision and help and grace for them. God, we pray for all of those who are working on vaccines and uh, antibody tests and all those kinds of things that are going to move us into a better place. We pray for wisdom from them, for them. And we pray for wisdom for all of our leaders who make decisions, for uh, Governor Holcomb, who will be making a decision in a week or so about um, how to move forward here in Indiana. We pray for wisdom for him that uh, he would just uh, do what's, what's best for all of us. Pray for wisdom for all of our officials from, from the White House all the way to our local courthouse. Jesus, give all these men and women who serve wisdom to lead well in a very hard season. And God, I pray that you would just flood our hearts with peace in this season. That those familiar words and that simple song that we've sung, that because he lives, may that give us peace and strength and courage as we navigate these waters. And Father, even though we're separated and in our own homes right now, I pray that you would hear us as we join together as one church to pray the prayer you taught us to pray. I mean, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's sing that last verse, Because He Lives. And then one day, I'll cross that bridge. for singing. If you want to, you can turn in your Bibles or on a device uh, to John 16. We're going to look at a couple of verses in there, the very end of that chapter, John 16. Now, I've, I've got a cart up here, and I'm going to pull it out here without knocking everything over. I've got some assorted items here on this cart. Uh, if you can see this very well with your camera or through your phone or whatever kind of means you're watching this, these are some cooking type items. Don't worry, I'm not going to cook anything. If I, uh, if I did try to cook something, you would not like that at all. But um, one night this week at our house, Michelle had a couple of days off, 
and we did breakfast for dinner uh, one night. I don't know if you ever do that, if you make breakfast for supper. Some of you probably love that. Breakfast is a good meal any time of day. I know some of you are anti-breakfast for dinner. Evan, I don't know if you're watching. If I remember right, you used to be pretty anti-breakfast for dinner. Um, I'm pretty okay with breakfast for dinner because that just means another chance to eat bacon, which is always fantastic and always a-okay in my book. So we did breakfast for dinner one night, and Michelle and Chloe put it all together, and uh, the main thing was pancakes. And again, I don't know if you can see any of this, if you can see where I'm going, but these would be all the ingredients you would need for pancakes I don't have eggs up here, which is probably a good thing that would just spoil. Uh, and if I didn't have pancakes or eggs, that would be a pretty rough pancake. But these are the ingredients you need to make pancakes. Really, all of them are pretty ordinary. You got uh, milk. This is empty, by the way. Don't worry. And uh, flour. Some of you may use vegetable oil, butter. Uh, you might put a little sugar, a little baking soda in there. Some of you may do a little dash of salt if you're going to make pancakes. Pretty ordinary, pretty basic ingredients, but all of them are pretty essential if you're going to make a good pancake. Now last week, I brought up a phrase that can be a help to us in a season like this, a phrase you see all over your Bibles, and that phrase, there's a, if, you, if you're not already hungry, if you're not already eating pancakes right now, maybe this is a good suggestion there. Put the bowl of cereal down, get something good. Actually, let me take that back. Wait till we're done and then go make the pancakes. Don't leave right now. Come back later and do that. But here's the phrase I gave you last week. Take heart. You see it all over your Bibles, Old Testament, New Testament. We're going to look at kind of the famous place where Jesus uses this word. And if you're going to take heart, we said last week, what does that even mean to take heart? especially in seasons like this and the definition I kind of gave you last week, a couple of parts to it. Uh, when the Bible tells us to take heart in difficult seasons, it means to, to be encouraged, to be comforted, and even to, to be courageous in whatever season you find yourself in. Now, if you're going to do that, if you're going to actually take heart, just like pancakes, there's some pretty key ingredients that go into that some key ingredients that will actually help you do that, to take heart in difficult seasons. And we looked at one of those last week, the pretty big one, hope. If you're going to be courageous, if you're going to be comforted, if you're going to be encouraged in difficult seasons, an absolutely essential ingredient to taking heart is to have hope couple others that uh, we may or may not have time for in the weeks ahead, but if you're going to take heart, you need faith, you need love, faith, hope, and love. We know those are famous things in our Bible. You need that courage, and there's a basis for that. You need to be confident. You need community, and what a challenging thing is to have community and relationships, but if you have good relationships and good people in your life, that all helps you take heart. Those are all essential ingredients that are going to enable you to take heart in difficult seasons. But I'm going to touch on a different one this morning, and one that you may not think of. If you're going to be able to be encouraged to face this season with courage, to be comforted in all the heaviness of the season, something you're going to need, a pretty key ingredient, is clarity. You're going to need to have clarity to take heart and to navigate a season like this well. Now let me just kind of give you just kind of a working definition just for our purposes of what I mean when I use clarity in this context. context how clarity helps us take heart. Clarity is just the ability to make sense of your circumstances. It, it's this framework or this context that you can put your circumstance in that will help you make sense of it, maybe to a degree understand it, uh, maybe even to a degree find some peace in it. Clarity is essential if we are going to take heart in seasons like this. Absolutely vital for us. Let me explain how clarity works kind of in this way. So Again, all these are the essential ingredients for pancakes. You've got to have every one of them. Again, I said I don't have eggs. If you left eggs out, that would be a problem. 
same for each one of these things. If there's no flour, there's no pancake. If there's no milk, it's going to be rough. No butter, no sugar, no salt, that's not going to be great. If you don't have the syrup or the toppings, it's not going to be a good pancake. But as essential as all of these ingredients are, they may not be the most important ingredient in a pancake or the most important piece of making a pancake. I would say maybe the most important part of making a pancake that's going to make sense and be good is the bowl. you got to have a bowl, a container, to put all the stuff in. Because all these ingredients by themselves, mixed on their own, it's going to be strange, and it's absolutely going to be a mess. But if you dump them all into a container, you mix them all up, they begin to make sense, and you begin to form a good pancake. Well, clarity is the bowl, the container by which we can put all of our experiences, all of our, our hardships, all of our tragedies, our joys and concerns. We can put all of that into the bowl and find some meaning, find some clarity, find a degree of understanding and even a degree of purpose in whatever season that we find ourselves in, even a season like this. So clarity is crucial as we navigate these kinds of seasons. And for a lot of you, you, you probably already know, one of the things that's so frustrating about this season that we're in right now is there's not a lot of clarity, but there is a whole lot of uncertainty. I mean, we don't know uh, when is this going to end, What's the world going to look like when this thing does end? Is my family going to be okay? Are my loved ones going to be okay? We're pretty short on clarity right now, but we have an overabundance of uncertainty. Well, Jesus is going to help us navigate seasons like that we're in right now and others like it. He's going to give us some clarity. Actually, he's giving the disciples some clarity here in John 16. And the clarity he's going to give these men in a very heavy moment, in a very difficult season, is going to end up producing peace in their life. Now, think about that. If you don't have clarity about the circumstances you're in, about the decisions you need to make, about how to handle whatever phase of life you find yourself in, doesn't that just give you frustration? Then, there, If there's no clarity, doesn't it raise anxiety? and stress, and headaches, and cause you to toss and turn as you try to sleep at night. If there is a lack of clarity, you have all of those negative side effects. But if you have clarity, it produces a natural byproduct of having clarity in your life and about your circumstances. It's peace. So here's what Jesus says, and here's kind of how Jesus dives into this thing. This is uh, John chapter 16, uh, the very last two verses of that chapter. Now, this comes at the, very, the end of a very long speech from Jesus. Uh, people smarter than me call this the farewell discourses. This is a, kind of the, the goodbye speech Jesus gives the disciples. It really begins back in John 13 with the Last Supper. You've got the issues of Judas there. You've got an issue with Peter. And as they begin to move about Thursday night, the night before he goes to the cross on Friday, he gives this great long speech, this farewell discourse. Uh, John 17, he prays for them. And then by John 18, he's arrested. So this is one of the longest speeches we have from Jesus in your Bible. Beginning in chapter 13, chapter 17 gives you a closing prayer, but these last two verses in 16 kind of wrap up the speech and everything that he was telling them. And in this farewell discourse, he says some really encouraging things, some really hopeful things, but he also says some really hard things. You get a glimpse of that in verse 32 as he begins to head for home here. He tells what is now just 11 disciples, a time is coming, and in fact has come, when each of you will be scattered, each to your own home. I don't know if there's a verse in the Bible you could relate to more right now 
All of us will be scattered, each to our own home. This is 2020 thus far, the spring of 20. We're all scattered in our own home. Now, while we can relate to that in our own sense, what that means in the context where Jesus is telling that is the arrest is coming. He's going to be arrested and drug off into a a trumped-up trial and then put on the cross. And when all of that happens, he tells them, all of you are going to scatter. You're going to run. You're going to flee. Now, again, there is a lot of hopeful things in this speech. He promises the Holy Spirit. He explains how they can have peace. He gives them clarity that even though he's leaving, it's not going to be forever. But there's a lot of hard things in this speech. And he tells them some pretty hard things about themselves that they don't want to hear. Again, if, if you've been around us before, or maybe been to one of our Monday, Thursday services, we've been in and out of this night before and talked about all the ins and outs of it. Jesus has unloaded three big bombshells on these guys. One of you will betray me. Peter's going to deny me. And I'm going to go and die. And if that wasn't enough, when the events of all this take place, all of you are going to scatter. You're going to run and you're going to flee. You're going to leave me all alone. He finishes out that verse and says, But I'm not alone, for my Father is with me. This is a very, very heavy way to end the speech. And thankfully, he doesn't stop at verse 32. He brings the speech to an end, verse 33, which gives you some hope and a great conclusion to what is an amazing discourse from Jesus. Verse 33, and if you've been around church at all, you may know this verse well. We quoted it and read it a couple of times even last Sunday. Here's what he says in verse 33. He explains why he's told them all this. I've told you all these things, this three plus chapters worth of a speech, I've told you all of that so that in me you may have peace. The reason why I'm telling you all of this stuff is to give you peace. It is a long speech from Jesus, full of good things, full of hard things. But the reason why he's explaining all of it to them is really to give them some clarity, some understanding about what's going on and what's about to take place, and even what their lives are going to look like going forward after this fateful weekend. I've told you all of this so that in me you will have peace. He's giving them a framework. He's laying out the bowl that they're going to be able to put all the ingredients of this night in, the arrest, the betrayal, Peter's denial, uh, persecution that's going to come, uh, what life is going to look like for these men without Jesus by their side, what the ministry is going to be going forward. He's giving them a framework or a bowl to put all of those things in so they can have clarity as they enter a season that's going to feel like, for them, it's full of uncertainty. Now, really, there's two parts, two big pieces that build this framework that will give them clarity. And I'll touch on these two, and then we'll sing, and then we'll, we'll sign off and let you get back to your, about your Sunday. Here's the two pieces that they need to keep clear in their mind that will give them some clarity. And I hope these things will be helpful to you and to me as well as we navigate a season of uncertainty. The first one, you kind of find it in the middle of verse 33. Now, this is not the verse you want to read. This is not what you want your Bible to say. You want your Bible to say some things much more upbeat, optimistic, and positive. And it, and it does, and he will, just, but just hang on. Before you get to the positivity, he lays out a pretty heavy reality. In this world, you will have trouble. Not you might have trouble, not you could have some trouble, not every once in a while there may be some hard days. In this world, you will have trouble. So the first thing that's going to help us kind of get some clarity in seasons of uncertainty is just being very clear about this, that Troubles will come. 
it is an inevitability of life in this world. Hard days, hard things, and troubles will come our way. Now again, I know I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. We're not breaking any new ground here. Uh, the light bulb didn't just go off on you. There, you If you have had a life that's been pretty blessed so far, we're all in this season now, a season of some hardships and some troubles with what's going on. But this is not anything new to you. You know this is a reality of life in this world to some degree and on varying levels all of us have experienced troubles. We sang about this in our first song just a moment ago. I don't know if you caught it or not, but everybody has trials and temptations. Everybody knows heartbreak and isolation to varying levels and to varying degrees. We all experience some sort of troubles as we navigate life in this world. But even though that's a reality that all of us know, isn't it funny how we're still surprised when troubles come? We're, we're caught off guard, we're taken aback, we're still rattled and still shaken when you find yourself in the middle of a season that's troublesome. Even though we know intellectually that's a reality, when reality hits home, we're still rattled and shaken when the troubles come our way. When I was teaching school, I remember I had a, a meeting with a couple other teachers I was on, the, on a team with, and we were all socialized teachers, and we used to meet daily for just to kind of go over curriculum and all of that. And I remember one of the veteran teachers came in, uh, and she was just kind of, you know, bemoaning how, you know, kids today and how kids have changed. And I'm just, I'm surprised that when these kids come to class, they're not ready for class. I'm surprised they're not ready to go. And one of the other veteran teachers said to her, how long have you been teaching? I'm surprised that you're surprised. And that's always stuck with me. And I think in part because you see this reality in, in Scripture. Peter says this, essentially the same thing. Don't be surprised at the fiery trials that you're going to go through as if something strange were happening to you. Don't be shocked, don't be surprised that in this world you will have trouble. And again, I know we all intellectually know that, but we're still rattled and shaken when troubles come. And I wonder, for some of us who would call ourselves Christians, if sometimes that reality hits a little harder. Maybe this is not you, and maybe this has not been your experience, but for some, there's this kind of mentality that if, if I come to faith, if I start showing up at church, if I start reading my Bible, then life is just going to get better. Now, it does, but it, always, but it doesn't always in the ways that we want it to. Coming to faith, coming to church... Reading your Bible is a glorious help. It's an absolute blessing. But it does not mean you will have a trouble-free life. So as Peter said, don't be surprised when those troubles come your way. It's an inevitability. In this world, you will have these things. And again, we, we may not admit this, but a lot of us kind of function and we live with this mentality that if I'm a good person, good things should happen to me. And if you're maybe a not-so-good person, well, maybe you get what you deserve. But if I'm good and doing what I need to do, then good things should come our way. But that couldn't be any more contrary to the message you see in the Gospels. Because this is John 16. Jesus is arrested in John 18. Before long, he'll be on a cross and crucified. See, Christianity says even the very best among us, the perfect Son of God, experienced the full weight of the troubles that this world can hurl at it. It is an inevitability that in this world, troubles will come. 
Don't be blind to that. Don't be surprised by that. Don't live in denial of that. Don't ignore that or minimize that. Because if you do, if you deny and minimize and ignore and try to put that off to the side, when troubles come, you will have anything but peace. If you live in denial of that reality, you're going to find frustration, anxiety. You might even find a faith that really doesn't work for you. But that's not the faith we see pointed out here in the Gospels. Jesus is very clear. In this world, there's going to be trouble. It's going to come your way. But that's not all that he says. That's kind of the first staple, the first piece to get in mind as you create this framework of clarity for seasons like this. If it ends there, again, we don't have, there's no reason to hope. There's no reason to get out of bed in the morning. There's no reason to do good or try to be good if that's all there is. But the last part of the verse changes everything. He ends verse 33, but take heart. There's that phrase. I have overcome the world. Take heart. I have overcome the world. And that's the second thing you need to keep in mind as we create this framework that's going to give us clarity. One, there is going to be troubles, but two, Jesus has overcome them. In this world, there's hardships, but Jesus has overcome this world. And, and maybe that's the part of this that you need to be reminded of right now. I know I need to be reminded of it as this season lingers on and I think somewhere around week five, week six, I'm not even sure where we are with this anymore. But as it just continues on, I need to be reminded that pandemics don't win. Sickness doesn't win. Death doesn't have the final say. Jesus overcame the world. This world is filled with troubles and hardships, but we have a reason to hope and a reason to find peace. You know, as Christians, if all we had was a Friday crucifixion, there'd be no reason to hope, and there'd be no reason to have peace in a world of trouble. But Jesus says, even before the events of the weekend start, the, again, the arrest doesn't take place until chapter 18. The crucifixion is later. Even before all of that gets going, he says, I have, present tense, it's finished, it's done. I have already overcome the world. All the hardships, all the tragedies, sin, and before we know it, it's going to be even death itself. I've overcome all of it. I've won the battle. I've won the victory. I've overcome before they even get moving in all this. And because Jesus did overcome the world, you and I can experience peace in hardships like we're in right now. We can experience victory over sin and over death. I've seen a couple of places that have highlighted this uh, statement from a man uh, from some years ago, a preacher named Andy Stanley, used in a sermon last week. I've seen a few articles uh, that, that talked about this, this helpful item uh, this week. It's called the, the fancy term for you, the Stockdale Paradox. Now, history buffs, Lincoln, if you're watching, Corey, if you're watching, you may remember, Tom McCandless, you might be remembering, uh, Admiral Jim Stockdale. I remember uh, when I was first kind of became aware of things politically, I remember him as a, uh, a vice presidential candidate who ran alongside of Ross Perot. And I, what I remember from that is he was ill-prepared for that debate. He, uh, he just looked like a fumbling old man, just wasn't his best, which is unfortunate because Admiral Jim Stockdale is an amazing man with an amazing story. He was, he spent, uh, during Vietnam, he spent eight years in the Hanoi Hilton. He was the, the highest ranking U.S. official to be captured and put in that fateful Hanoi Hilton. Eight years. And, and an author that wrote a pretty significant book named Jim Collins interviewed 
uh, Admiral Stockdale about his experiences and asked him, how did you get through it? How did you survive eight years, and how did others fail? What made you different? And I'm going to paraphrase what he says. If you get a chance today, you should just Google uh, the Stockdale paradox and read his actual words, but I'm just going to simplify it and paraphrase it. He says, the way I got through it was I held two realities together. I face the reality that I am in a situation that is awful, that is dark, that is evil. But at the same time, I held this promise that I'm going to succeed in the end. I was honest about the realities of eight years in the Hanoi Hilton. But I also held on to hope in the end of the story. That I was going to come through and I was going to survive. I held both those things together. I didn't ignore the realities of the hardship. I didn't turn a blind eye to that and just become some uh, bright side optimist. I faced the realities, but at the same time I held on to hope at the end, for the end of the story. And he came through that when so many others didn't. This is the lens that Jesus gives us to give us clarity as we navigate life in this world. This is the bowl that Jesus gives us to put in all of those experiences, hardships, tragedies, joys and concerns, that in this world there is trouble. We're sure going through that right now. But we also put in there the hope found at the end of the story. That Jesus has overcome the world. Katie and Dawn and Larry are going to make their way back forward. We're going to close out and sing our last song. As they're making their way, just a quick thought of how do you find some help and some clarity in this as you hold these two realities that in this world there's trouble, but Jesus has overcome this world. You fix your eyes on Jesus. One of my favorite verses in the Bible, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, I'll pick it up in verse 2. The writer of Hebrews says, Fix your eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, he disregarded its shame, and he's taken his seat at the right hand of the Father. Consider him who endured such hostilities against himself from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary or lose heart. There is trouble in this world. You know that well. We're feeling that right now. But there's victory as well. We don't just have a Friday crucifixion. We also have a Sunday resurrection. We have a Savior that overcame, who triumphed over sickness, sin, death, car wrecks, cancer, pandemics. And that hope can fill your life with peace, even right now. As we sang before, we're going to close with this. Because he lives, you can face tomorrow. Will we get through this season? Absolutely. Will there be other difficult experiences to come? You can count on it. Will trouble have the final say over us? In this world, not a chance. Because he lives, we can overcome. Because he lives, we can face tomorrow and all the fear that assails us. Because Jesus has the final say and victory was secured on Resurrection Sunday. Even though there's troubles in this world now, Boy, is life ever worth the living just because he lives.
pray you know that good news that because he lives you can face whatever he, whatever comes our way now, i don't know where you are with the lord right now or what's going on in your life if you're one of our church members or if you're someone just who found us on facebook here if you need to reach out to us for any reason if you were one to say i'm not really clear about this hope i have in christ i don't have a lot of peace right now I'm not really sure that I've got a lot of confidence in the end of the story. All I see is the reality of pandemics, furloughs, layoffs, hardships, and fear. If you want to reach out to us, there's a number of ways you can. You can put a comment right there on that Facebook feed, and I'll look at it. You can send us a message on Facebook. If you'd like to call the church for prayer, the number's right there. It's also on our feed there. And if you want to email the church, it's a long email address, but may be easy to remember. It's your whole name, Lexington Presbyterian Church, and that's at gmail.com. You can always find more about us on our website as well. If you have a need, if you have a joy or concern, if you want some prayer, please reach out to us. We want you to walk through this season with clarity. There is trouble right now. There is hardships for sure. But we can take heart, for Jesus has overcome the world. Let's pray as we close. Gracious God, we're so thankful that you have came into this world. You suffered all the troubles and the hardships this world could hurl at us, and you overcame them. You went to the cross on Friday, and then you rose from that grave on Sunday. And may that overcoming victory overwhelm us with peace in every season, the troubled ones and the blessed ones. May they all be filled with your peace. And may the Lord now bless you. May he keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. And may he be gracious unto you. The Lord has counts upon you. And may he give you peace, both now and the life everlasting. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, have a very blessed week.